everybody, this is Robert Burke, and uh, I wanted to do a video today. There have been a lot of great blogs, a lot of great videos. There is a lot of reference material on the internet today about how to run a successful board game related Kickstarter project. There's been a bunch of blogs already that talks about mistakes to avoid. Um, but I thought I would throw my hat into the equation. Uh, I have run some successful board game Kickstarter projects in the past, and I've learned some things over the years while I've been doing this. And I kind of want to share them because I continue to see the same kind of mistakes made over and over again on Kickstarter, especially by new project creators. So if you are planning to do a board game related Kickstarter project, I hope this is helpful. And I hope it will help you avoid some of the mistakes uh, that I have made in the past and that I continue to see people make. If you can avoid these things and follow these tips, I think it's going to make it a lot easier for you. And that's really my goal here is to try to just impart some information that I think is valuable and kind of add it to all the other information that's out there. Uh, so hopefully if you've stumbled across this uh, because you're looking on how to do a Kickstarter project, I hope it's helpful. All right, so uh, we're going to start with number 10. So number 10. All right, so number 10 is an easy one. It's if you do no advertising, okay? So this is an easy mistake to avoid. If you cannot afford to do any advertising on your Kickstarter project right now, then you probably shouldn't be launching your Kickstarter project right now. Save up, take some time to extend the project timeline out, get some, a little bit of money together at least so you can do some advertising to get your game in front of people. Every Kickstarter project needs to do some sort of advertising. Uh, where and how you do it is a matter of opinion. Some, <clears throat> some places are better than others. Uh, kind of depends on what your project is and what your theme is, where you're going to target your advertising dollars. Uh, but you cannot expect to do a successful Kickstarter campaign with zero advertising. I'm not saying you can't do it, and that's why this is number 10, but it's very important, I think, that you do it. Uh, buy some banner ads on key uh, sites. Uh, or buy Facebook ads. You can buy, you can write a good post on Facebook and you can promote it for seven bucks, right? So that's, that's a form of advertising to get people looking at your project to make them aware that you even exist. If people are not aware that you are there, then you are not going to raise money. So ads are a way to drive people to at least check your page out. Right, because you want to get people looking at your new game. <clears throat> uh, you should also, you know, if you don't have any money at all and you can't afford anything uh, and you can't wait, uh, at least reach out to podcasters. And you should be doing this anyway. Reach out to podcasters, see if they're interested in an interview to talk about your game or your design process or the theme. However, you can spin it to them. You want to make sure you try to get them interested to have you on their show or to at least mention your game, right? So be nice uh, and spin it in a way. Whatever is interesting about your game, let them know that. Is it the theme? Is there any controversy about it? Is this your first project ever? Let them know. Uh, give them a reason to get you on their show. Uh, same thing with with uh, board game bloggers. Also, you should be doing press releases, right? Do a press release to talk about you and your game and what you're trying to do and what the game is about. Send it out to your local media. You'll find local media will pick up stories about people that are running Kickstarters, especially if it's interesting, right? And it's if it's slow news day, the way you spin it is important. So create that press release and send it out to bloggers, to board game uh, podcasters, and to, to your local media. That doesn't cost you anything. But again, get an advertising budget. Even if it's just $100, figure out what your budget is, and then go do the research to find out where you should target those advertising dollars during your campaign. So number 10, uh, mistake to avoid is to not do any advertising. You should be doing something. All right, number nine, 
uh, you've heard this before, or you should have heard this before, is no gameplay video. You are trying to sell a board game. You are trying to convince people that your board game idea is a great one, worth their money, and that they're going to enjoy playing it. So show them. Show them how your game plays. It's very simple. And this does not have to be professionally produced. You don't have to spend hundreds or thousands of dollars to make this video. You can do it yourself with your iPhone or with a digital camera. If you don't have a tripod, set it up on some books. Do what you need to do to have a view of the table and all your components, your prototype components, and do a walkthrough. And do it yourself if you have to do it yourself. Uh, you know, you need to link to your rules, uh, but you have to go further and you have to have that gameplay video on the Kickstarter page that shows how your game is, is played. Uh, this will give your potential backers an idea of whether or not they're going to like the game. If they don't see how the game is played, they have no idea. And not everybody is going to go read through the rules. All right, So it is very important that you have a gameplay video. If you don't, you're going to see people, they're going to start asking you, where's the gameplay video? I'm interested, but I don't see a gameplay video. Uh, don't be in that position. Before you launch your project, have that gameplay video ready. Have it on your Kickstarter page when you launch. Do it. Number eight. This goes along with number nine a little bit, but I think it's, it, it's more important to some, not as important to others but you have to have your rules linked on your Kickstarter page. Your rules should be at least 95% of the way there before you launch your project. People are expecting more finished game projects on Kickstarter today. It's not like it used to be where it was just more of an idea. You have to have something solid that gamers can read those rules and understand what the game is about. Now, this doesn't mean that if you have a gameplay video, you don't need rules, and if you have rules, you don't need a gameplay video. You need both. Some players are going to require the rules before they pledge. So don't lose those backers because your rules are not linked. Hopefully, you have the rules written out and at least gone through a couple versions of editing before you launch your Kickstarter project. If it's not to that point, you should not yet be launching. You should wait until the game is tighter and more finished. So if you have the rules, and you should, you need to link to them. Let people download them, let people read them, and if you can do a print and play version so people can try it, even better, right? Now, I'm not saying that's something you have to do because you don't have to have, a, you can sell the print and play version as a, as a reward here. That's what I've always done. Um, but my newer project, I'm gonna actually, I made it available for free. Uh, you can do that too, but make sure you have rules when you launch the Kickstarter. Very important. All right, number seven, have reviews published before or during your campaign. So this means you're going to have to do a lot of prep work. And one thing that you're going to see run through this video that I'm doing here with these top 10 is you've got to do the work, right? It's you kickstarters are a lot of work. You don't want to rush through it. You want to make sure all your ducks are in a row and that you've done all your legwork before you click that launch button. And making sure you have reviews already published or ready to go is a big part of this. You need to have enough money to invest to create at least 10 prototypes of your game. Now you can do very good prototypes on the Game Crafter or through print and play productions. Those are two that I recommend. They can make the box for you. They can do cards, components. You can make very nice professional prototypes and then you want to send those out to reviewers to get some reviews on the web before you launch. If you get a good review, you can link that video. You can embed that review video or, or put the link directly on your Kickstarter page to show people, hey, I'm not the only one that thinks this game is good. You know, there are some independent reviews uh, that really like the game. 
So it is very important because a lot of people, they're going to be looking for reviews. They're going to be looking to see what other people think about the game. They're not just going to throw their money at you, especially if it, you're a first-time uh, game designer on Kickstarter. It's very important that you have some opinions about your game that are published out there, either before you launch or to time it with them to make sure that they publish it during your campaign so that they're available. Now, one thing about sending prototypes out, they're expensive to do, right? They're going to cost you a little bit of money. They shouldn't uh, uh, estimate between 200 and 300, maybe up to 500, depending on how big your game and how many components there are. But you want to have those professional ones to send out. But don't just send them out blindly. Contact those reviewers who you think would be interested in your game, right? Maybe they review the type of game you, you are making right like if you are making a two card battle game you don't want to send a two a two player battle card game to someone who doesn't like those kind of games uh, you don't want to send an ameritrash game if that's the game you're making to a reviewer who only loves euro games right you want to try and pick and choose your reviewers based on the kind of game that you're making right and make sure that they're willing to review it and get a confirmation from them that they will before you send out those uh, expensive prototypes because you don't want to just send them out and have them never have nobody review them then you're just out of that money for no benefit and you'll find that many reviewers out there will be very interested in reviewing your game especially if you present it professionally and it looks good and you've been doing some legwork in the communities already right so very important now there's also some paid preview options out there uh, you can pay some reviewers uh, to do a walkthrough, basically, of your game. It's not a real review, but it's at least a way for people to see uh, what your game is and how it works. Now, the people who do that usually have a bigger audience, right? So it could be worth it. So that's something you're going to have to figure out. If you think paying, you know, $250 to have a preview done uh, by somebody is worth that money or not. But people will see it and it will get you eyeballs. And that is the name of the game with Kickstarter. Is you want to get your project in front of as many different people as you can. And if you don't do reviews, if you don't have prototypes and don't send them out for reviewers to write about it, then you're missing a huge opportunity. Don't make that mistake. Make sure you have reviews of your game before you launch. That's number seven. All right, number six uh, seems obvious, and there's a little gray area here, but number six is setting the right funding goal, stretch goal, and rewards. You need to set the right numbers on your project page when you launch that Kickstarter project. Now, there's different debates on how you're going to set the prices and if you do exclusive rewards or non-exclusive rewards, if that's a good idea or not. I don't think those kind of things matter as much because, you know, exclusives versus non-exclusive works. I've seen projects work both ways with those, so I don't think that matters so much. But when you're setting your goal, for example, you want to make sure you set your goal for what you need. Right. If you set it too high, then people are going to say, you know, they're never going to make that much money. I'm not going to back that. Or he doesn't. Or even worse, they don't know what they're doing. They don't need that much money. That's a money grab. I'm not going to back them. Uh, alternately, if you set a goal that's too low, people who understand how much it costs to actually manufacture and ship a board game, if they see that you're asking for less than that, and especially if it's your first project, they're going to say, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's asking for way too little money. He cannot deliver what he's promising with that amount of money. Now, maybe you have $10,000 or $15,000 you're going to invest yourself. If that's true, you need to make sure that's clear on your Kickstarter page. That, hey, I'm only asking for $10,000 because I already have $15,000 that I'm going to put into it. Right. But even then, I think it's better that you ask for the full amount that you need to manufacture and ship those games than to ask for less and hope people see that on your page that you're actually putting money in. Right. So something to keep in mind. 
Uh, and that's more true for people who don't have a track record on Kickstarter yet. Uh, if you're, you know, if you've already got successful projects on and delivered on them on Kickstarter, then people n already know that you know what you're doing because they can click right there and it shows all the projects that you've done in the past and if they were successful or not. Um, but make sure you're asking for the right amount of money. Your rewards, make sure they make sense. Make sure they're priced at the market rate or below the market rate. Unless you're adding a lot of exclusives. If you're adding a lot of exclusive content to Kickstarter, then you can ask for even more money than they would pay retail and you'll find people are willing to do that. Don't price yourself out of the market and don't price yourself way too low either. So the reward tiers are important. I would also advise against doing things like t-shirts and mugs and swag like that. It's a fulfillment nightmare. It's going to cost you a lot more than you you think it's going to cost in the end, and it's not really adding a lot of value to your project. So make sure any add-ons that you have or stretch goals that you have are related to the game, right? That's something I definitely suggest to save you a lot of headache. Very important. All right, number five may sound crazy to those of you in the board gaming hobby, but to a lot of people, I see a lot of projects on Kickstarter that have this problem, and they're usually the projects that fail, is a mistake to avoid is not understanding the hobby. All right, so there's a mass market board game, uh, you know, uh, sector out there talking about Hasbro, Games like, you know, Monopoly and Scrabble and Mousetrap and Sorry and all those games that sells millions of bazillions of copies of games. If you're trying to create a game to compete with that, you're going to have a very hard time. Kickstarter success in board games is driven by the hobby board game market. That's why you see so many successful board game projects on Kickstarter is because the hobby board game market is growing. These are people who take board games seriously and they're looking for real stimulation, mental stimulation. They're looking for strategy. They're looking for unique mechanics. They're looking for great art and unique themes. Uh, they're not looking for a roll and move game. All right, so there's three kinds of games that if you're making one of these three kinds of games, you need to go back to the drawing board and redevelop your game before you launch it on Kickstarter. All right, uh, the first one is collectible card games. Magic the Gathering owns that market, all right? People are not going to support collectible card games on Kickstarter because a lot of hobby board gamers hate collectible card games, for one, uh, and the people that don't, they play Magic. And when they spend money, it's going to be on more Magic cards. So you are up against a huge juggernaut if you are trying to compete in that space. You're setting yourself up for failure if you do. Now, I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm sure there's somebody out there with enough drive and enough passion and enough money to make it work, but I would recommend highly against it. So don't do a CCG game, a collectible card game. Number two is a roll and move game, all right? Roll and move is just a mechanic that is that board gamers avoid like the plague if they see roll and move they want nothing to do with it, right? Because it reminds them of Monopoly and all those older games uh, that we've evolved from over the last two decades, right? So if it's a roll and move game, it's just a very stale mechanic that is gonna show that you really don't know what's going on in the board game space today. They have evolved, board games have evolved incredibly over the past 20 years. So if your design is based on rolling the dice and moving the pawn around the outside of a board or through the middle of a board, or if you're rolling dice and moving stuff, and that's the main part of it, then you need to go back to the drawing board. If you haven't heard of games like Settlers of Catan or Ticket to Ride, then you need to do some research and start playing some of these newer games to understand the market before you try to get into it. Number three... <clears throat> The third kind of game is chess variants. I see these on Kickstarter all the time. It's people who think they can reinvent the game of chess and have the next chess and sell a bazillion copies of a chess variant. You won't do it. 
All right, there have been so many failed chess variants on Kickstarter, I can't even, I don't even think I could begin to count them. All right, it's not a unique idea. It's been done a lot, right? Lots of people have had the idea, wow, what if I took chess and made it a little different or made the board bigger or made the pieces move differently? Um, now, there are, you know, there are exceptions to all these rules. You know, I did see a successful project called the Duke, but it had very unique, very unique uh, mechanics. Uh, it basically an uh, abstract game like chess, but it was also very unique. But if you're, you know, doing just a basic chess variant where you've changed some rules and you're on a 10 by 10 grid or a 12 by 12 grid, then you need to nix that idea. All right. Try to do something a little more unique than a chess variant. So those are the three things you need to avoid. Uh, you need to avoid collectible card games, roll and move games, and chess variants. You need to understand the board game hobby and what is hot in the hobby right now. What do people like? What are the themes that people like? What are the mechanics that people like? What kind of uh, things are you trying to get across in your game? Are you trying to drive player interaction? Are you trying to drive strategy? Uh, you know, what's your goal? Make sure that what you're doing fits in with what hobby gamers are looking for. If you're going back to all those old games from the 70s that you remember as a kid, it's not going to cut it. So that's number five, not understanding the hobby. All right, number four is not understanding your market. All right, so we've already talked about making sure you understand the board game hobby. Within the board game hobby, there are many different markets, right? So you want to make sure you understand your market. Is this a family game that you want parents and kids to play together? Is this a kid's game that you want very young children to play? Is this a game for tweens? Is this a game for Euro gamers? Is this a filler game that is meant to play really quick with a lot of people? Is it an Ameritrash game that drives a lot of interaction and includes some randomness? Who is your market? If you understand your market, it's going to help you advertise, make your advertising dollars go further because you're going to be able to target where you're advertising. You're going to be able to target where you're sending your prototypes. But you're not going to be able to do that if you don't understand who your market is. So it's very important that you understand that. Um, no game is for everyone. Uh, so be unapologetic about who the game will be for and who it won't be for. All right? You can't get everybody. Not everybody is going to like any game. I don't care. The games I love the most, I can go on Board Game Geek and look at my favorite games and look at who's rated them low. And there's people that hate them, absolutely hate them and have rated them a one. So you can't please everybody. Know who your market is and go after that market. Be specific. So that is number four. Know your market. Number three. We've heard number three so many times, and yet we continue to see uh, games on Kickstarter that clearly have not been play tested. So lack of play testing is my number three mistake to avoid when you're kickstarting a board game project. Uh, board gamers who use Kickstarter have become quite expert in determining whether a game is fully cooked or not. They can they recognize the signs. There have been too many underdeveloped games funded through Kickstarter, and the Wild West days of people just throwing money at anything are over. Those days are gone. People are sick of getting burnt by a project that has pretty art and looks good, and they get it home, and the game is just a mess. Right? So you can't do that. And the only way you can prevent that is to make sure you play test your game. And not just with your family, not just with your friends, not just with your play test groups. It's not enough to just do it with my play test group and go to a play test group two cities away and play test it with them. You've got to do blind play testing too. You've got to be able to make a prototype or at least a print and play and convince other groups to play test it for you. Unpubs are great events where you can take your game. Conventions have prototype events, which are great to go play test your games with real gamers who are going to give you real feedback. 
And blind play testing is very important because when you're not doing blind play testing, especially when you're present, um, you're teaching them how to play the game, right? You want people playing the game by reading the rules. And you want to be taking notes when you hear somebody say, oh, I don't understand that rule. You want to know where the rules are not clear. You're not just tightening up the rules of your game, you're tightening up how you write the rule book, which is very, very important as well. Make sure your development process is public. This is content that will attract people to your game before you launch the Kickstarter, and it will prove to them that you are doing playtesting. All right, if you've not already done multiple rounds of internal and blind playtesting, then you should not be kickstarting your game. All right, because and when you think you've playtested enough, you need to playtest it again. Because inevitably, this happens to me, I'm like, I'm so excited, my game is done. But we playtest it again, and we find one little thing that we change, and guess what? It makes the game better, or closes a little loophole. You know, and you keep doing that. And just when you, and when you think you're done, you do it again. You think you're done, you do it again, right? And then at some point you're going to be like, you're going to be so happy that your game is as tight as it can be and you're sure it's as tight as it can be. And, you know, you put that on Kickstarter and you're confident. You don't want to put it on Kickstarter and have all these people asking questions about the rules and you don't have answers because you haven't played through with enough blind playtest groups to understand that those issues even existed, right? Kickstarter is not the place to do your blind playtesting, right? It's the place to sell your product. Your product should be done, or at least 95% done before you put it on Kickstarter, right? Sometimes things will come up that you can change, but make sure you have multiple rounds of playtesting and blind playtesting done before you launch. I can't tell you how important this is, and I can't tell you how many people I see that continue to ignore this advice. So please do it, play test your game. All right, number two is have great art and graphic design. If you don't have great art and graphic design on your Kickstarter page, that's a huge mistake. That's what's going to attract people to research your game more is the images that you present to people, the components, the cards, the board, the logo, the colors, how everything fits together. Does it look like an amateur did it? Or does it look like you hired a professional graphic designer? Can it all hold its own against the designs you see put out by Fantasy Flight Games? Is the art of the same caliber? Is the design of the same caliber? It's important because it's going to get people, when they look at your first image, they're going to say, wow, that looks interesting. Why? They don't know anything about your game, right? All they do is they see an image that captures their attention and they click it. And then if they watch the video and the video is very well done and the game looks very well made, then they're going to read more. They're going to start reading the pledge levels, right? So the biggest thing that's going to attract people to your page and keep them interested is what does it look like? What does the art and graphic design look like? If you don't have that, they're never going to get to the point where they read the rules and watch the gameplay video to figure out, hey, how does this game actually play? Right? If it doesn't look good, they're never going to get there. Right? So you need to make sure that you're spending some money on art and graphic design. If you don't have the budget to do all the art and graphic design for your Kickstarter, that's fine. Right? Just make sure that you have some money to do at least some pieces to show people what the final quality is going to look like. You need to show that to people. And you'll find artists will work with you. Right? Artists, if you go to an artist and say, I really, I love your stuff. I want to use it for my game. Um, can I give you money for a C license just to use your images on my Kickstarter page? Right? Maybe I'll give you this X amount of dollars. I can use your images just on the Kickstarter page. If it funds, then I will pay you the full price to use them in the actual physical game. If it doesn't, you keep the seed money and you haven't lost anything. Your images just appear on my Kickstarter page. Artists will work with you on that kind of stuff, right? Artists understand because they're trying to make it just like you're trying to make it, right? So just be upfront, tell them how much what your budget is and, and, and what you can do for them. Uh, make sure you, they understand what you're trying to do and what your board game's about and you'll find a lot of them will be willing to work with you. 
graphic design, you know, you've got to have some good examples of what the final graphic design is going to look like on your project. If you're not a graphic designer, you shouldn't be doing it yourself. I see so many, you know, components on Kickstarter, cards and, and rule books and stuff that are very amateurish looking. And those are the projects that you'll never see raise any money, right? It's got to look good. You've got to make sure it looks good. So number two, the, uh, the number two mistake to avoid when launching a board game Kickstarter project is not having good art or graphic design. You need to have both of those things at least at a minimum to show to your backers on Kickstarter before you launch. Number two. And number one, number one, uh, I hear this talked about a lot too, and it's one of those things that you still see happen on a daily basis, almost, is not being active. You can't not be involved with a social community, especially online, and expect to succeed at Kickstarter. Kickstarter is an online community. Right. So you need to be active in some sort of board game community somewhere. You have to have the crowd before you can expect the funding. Right. So you might have heard that before and it's absolutely true. You should have a Facebook page for your game. You should have a board game geek page for your game. You should be active. If you don't have a page specifically for your game, you should be active in the board game geek community. You should be active on Facebook or you should be active on Twitter or you should be active on Reddit. You know, hopefully you're active in three or all of those places. But if you're not, you need to at least be active in one. You have to have a way to communicate and reach out to people who share your interests, right? Depending on the theme of your game, you should be involved in a virtual community that has interest in that particular theme, right? Whether it's World War II or apple farming or, you know, you know, earthworms. I don't care. Whatever the theme of your game is, there's a group out there that's interested in that theme. You need to find them, introduce yourself, and become active in that community well before you launch your game. Again, you need to have a crowd before you can expect the funding, all right? It's crowd funding. It's the crowd that you need, and you need them first. You're not just going to put up your game, and you're not going to fund if you're not bringing people in yourself. Kickstarter takes work, right? It's not an automatic thing, and I don't care how good your game is. If you don't follow these 10 items that I went over, if your game doesn't look good, if the graphic design isn't good, if you don't have rules, if you don't have a gameplay video, if you haven't been active on board game communities, if you have multiple, if you are making these mistakes, then your projects, it's not going to fund. And I've just got to be blunt with you, it's not going to fund. You've got to make sure Look at each of these points in, in these top 10 mistakes that I've gone through in this video today and make sure you're addressing each one of them. Once you do that, you should be successful. And I hope you sell a million copies. I really do. My name is Robert Burke, and I hope this was helpful. And I'll talk to you again soon. Bye.